so thank you for the introduction. So I will talk about our recent findings related to, um, to the initial computations of electron quantum and coupling quantities, and more specifically related to dynamical particles. So I will go relatively quickly on the introduction because this is already the fourth talk on, uh, on electron quantum coupling. So as you know, the electron quantum coupling plays an important role in many phenomena like superconductivity, the indirect light absorption, or the intrinsic mobility that is limited by the scattering of the electrons by the phonons in the material, just like Matteo explained in the, in the previous talk. And this is actually the dominating scattering mechanisms at high temperature because what well, the number of phonons increases or when the impurity concentration is very low. So when the sample is very clean and only the phonons remain. And then we only have the lattice scattering. So in this talk, I will focus on this phonon limited mobility in semiconductors. And uh, as Matthew explained, there are different formalisms to compute the mobility, but uh, for this talk, for the sake of simplicity, I will just focus on the SERTA. Uh, so we have an equation for the mobility where we have the electron velocities here, the derivative of the fermi dirac computation function. And then we have the electron lifetimes that depend on the scattering of the electrons by the, the phonons in the system. So in this equation, each phonon is characterized by the wave vector Q and a mode nu, and the scattering of an electron in the state nk by a phonon Q nu uh, depends on the electron phonon coupling that is quantified by the matrix elements G here. That actually describes the overlap between the wave function after the scattering in the state mk plus Q and the wave function in the state before the scattering, so the state nk that is uh, modified by the scattering potentials that come from the, from the related phonon here. And so in practice, we can compute this lifetime using ab initial methods. So we need DFT for the mass structure and DFTT for the phonon frequencies and the matrix elements. So we have everything that we need to compute the lifetimes and the mobility as well. The problem is that this integration over Q points converges very slowly. We typically need millions of Q points. Uh, but as you know, DFTT is not that cheap. So performing a few DFTT computations is fine, but uh, on a mesh that, it, that is that dense, well, good luck. So the solution is to use an interpolation procedure. So in other state-of-the-art software such as EPW, uh, that is within quantum espresso, people decided to interpolate the matrix elements directly using one year functions. Uh, but with Abinit, we decided to interpolate the scattering potentials without any one year functions and to compute the, the wave function in a non-self-consistent non way and then compute the matrix elements. So basically we compute the scattering potentials on a typical, let's say, 10 by 10 by 10 mesh using DFTT. And then we fully interpolate them on a much denser mesh. And in this way, we actually manage to converge the computation of the lifetime and then the mobility as well. OK, so now we know what we have to do to compute the, the form of limited mobility. But actually, we still have to describe some important physics that's happening in semiconductors and that we need to, to take into account if we want to obtain correct results in the end. So as I said, the, the scattering potentials describe how the phonons influence the electronic properties. And there are different interactions that we need to take into account that need to be included in these scattering potentials. And these effects are due to the changes in the charge density that follow the atomic displacements. So the first one appears in polar semiconductors where the longitudinal optical phonons create electrical dipoles that lead to a long range potential that has an important effect on the electrons. And this effect has actually already been described uh, by Frolich in the 50s, and it's the name Frolich interaction. Uh, but it has only been introduced recently in, uh, in first principles electron form computations in 2015. And in our work, what we have done is uh, that we have shown that dipoles are actually not the only important interaction. So actually, when atoms are displaced in the crystal, dynamical protopoles also appear, and also in non-polar semiconductors. So for instance, this shows the case of silicon, where we can clearly see that we have a quadrupolar change of the electronic density when the atom in the center is, uh, is displaced in or out of the plane. And that leads to a quadrupolar uh, scattering potential. Now, these interactions are actually already included when we perform the FPT computations. So I want to ask if they are already taken into account in the FPT, then why do we even need to think about it? Why do we care? Well, the problem comes from the fact that we have to interpolate the scattering potential. And to do that, we absolutely need to correctly describe these long range inter interactions. Otherwise, the inter interpolation just fades in the region around gamma. So these plots show the problem. Actually, we have the, the, the scattering potentials on the Q path, on the left for a polar semiconductor, galomarsenide, and on the right for a non polar semiconductor, so silicon. In blue, we have the DFPT potentials that we have obtained for 
almost equivalent with Q points here on the path that we have used the PPI to automate the computations. And then in green and in red, uh, we have the interpolate potentials that we obtained starting from a typical DFPT Q mesh, and then we, we interpolate them on this Q path. So first, if we don't consider the dipole interactions during the interpolation, we obtain the red line here. And you can clearly see that we have problems around gamma, right? Uh, and this is precisely the region, the region where the dipoles are important because they lead to the divergence of these potentials. And this divergence is completely not captured. And that can only lead to wrong lifetimes and then the wrong mobility in the end, especially when we know that the gray area here precisely corresponds to the, the few points that will actually allow for the scattering. So the few points the, the, which matter will be very badly represented and we will have very wrong results in the end. Now, including the dipoles, we do recover the DFPT results. So we do recover, we, we, we find again this divergence. And the same is true when we consider the dynamical quadrupoles. So the dynamical quadrupoles, they lead to discontinuities and not a diversion. So you see at gamma, we have a discontinuity of the DFPT potentials. And if we don't include the dynamical quadrupoles in the interpolation, then the interpolation will try to account for this discontinuity. And then that leads to unphysical oscillations in the region around gamma. And again, we will have just one result. And the, the correct behavior is restored once we include the dynamical quadrupoles in the procedure. So now, what do I mean when I say including the quadrupoles or the dipoles in the interpolation? Well, to understand that, let's first write the scattering potentials in the atomic representation here on the right. But it's related to the phonon mode representation uh, with the phonon eigenvector and the atomic masses here. And so basically in the code, we interpolate the, the, the atomic representation. We always work on the atomic representation. And what we do is actually very similar to the interpolation of the dynamical matrix to get the phonon frequencies, just like, like uh, Max explained today. So first we split the total scattering potentials into a short range in the long range part. Um, and we can actually do that because we have a model uh, a formula for this long range model that I will explain in, in two seconds. So now we have the short range part of the scattering potentials that we can interpolate because it does not contain the, the discontinuities and the divergence. Um, so once we have the short range part that is interpolated, we can add the long range part of the scattering potentials and then we obtain the full potential. And this is easy because this is basically a simple formula. And so this long range part is made of dipole, quadrupole, and even other terms that I will not describe here today. And these dipoles and quadrupole terms depend on the Born effective charges, the high frequency dielectric tensor, and the dynamical quadrupole tensor. And these are all quantities that we can compute with DFPT at gamma. And then we can use these to, uh, to integrate them in this model and use that in the interpolation. OK, so now that we've seen the basic principles, we can have a look at the actual impact of dynamical quadrupoles, why they are important. So here we have three materials, silicon, gallium arsenide, and gallium phosphide. And for each of them, we compute the mobility by integrating the matrix elements first and then the lifetimes uh, on the dense meshes that are given here. So for instance, for silicon, for these two points here, uh, we start from a six by six by six DFPT Q mesh. And then we interpolate the scattering potentials obtained on this 666 DFPT mesh. We interpolate them on the 144 by 144 by 144 Q mesh. Then we integrate that to get the lifetimes. And the lifetimes, we compute them on the 72 by 72 by 72 Q mesh. And then we integrate these lifetimes to get the mobility. Okay. And so in red, we interpolate the potentials without including the dynamical protocols. And in green, we do include them. And basically, you can see that without including the, the protocols in the interpolation, the mobility changes quite a lot when we when we change the, the, the initial DFPT mesh. And this should not be the case if the interpolation was stable. So that means that there, there, there is something wrong here, and this is due to the interpolation. And this is something that can only be fixed by including the dynamical protocols in the interpolation. And in this case, we have indeed something that is stable, and the result does not change when we keep densifying the starting grid. So, so it is working well. We can also analyze in, uh, in more details the impact of dynamical protocols on each phonon mode, so which phonon modes are the most impacted by this interaction and which modes are less affected. And to do that, we split the sum here over the phonon modes and we consider the lifetimes limited only by a single phonon mode. Okay, and then we, we, we use this lifetime to compute the mobility 
so that we have a single number for each mode. And we can actually compute the error on this single form of mode limiting mobility when we include or when we ignore the, the quadrupolar interaction. And this is what we, we get here for silicon, gallium phosphide, and gallium arsenide. So first in silicon, since it's a, a, a non-polar semiconductor, there is a quadrupole acoustic sum rule that, uh, that actually greatly reduces the impact of the quadrupoles for the acoustic modes. And most of the error comes from the, 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 the optical mode here. And for the polar semiconductors, it's the other way around uh, because the, 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 the acoustic modes are actually dictated by the piezoelectric coupling. And these modes are quite impacted by quadrupoles that has also been explained by Maximisto. So you can see that the total error on the mobility including all the modes in black here, so all the phonon modes included, is not negligible, right? It goes from 10% to 30% in the systems, and it even goes up to 70% in, in other systems that we've tested. So we have seen that piezoelectric coupling is closely related to dynamical quadrupoles, and that we have large errors for the acoustic mode because of that. And we can then look at what happens in the worst case scenario. So the case of a strongly piezoelectric system, that has a, uh, a dispersive conduction band that is located at gamma. So we don't have inter-valley scattering, we just have intra-valley scattering. And since the band is dispersive, uh, only small Q-wave vectors will be allowed. So this will uh, increase the importance of the, of the long-range interaction. So this is the case of zinc oxide, for instance. It's also the case of gallium nitride. And here you can see the mode decomposition of the scattering rates, and this shows that Actually, only a few modes contribute to, to, to the scattering rates. So we have the acoustic mode in red. We have the highest yellow mode in blue. And all the other modes uh, actually don't really contribute. In green here, they are, they are very small. They lead to very small uh, scattering rates. So they don't limit the mobility. They don't really contribute. Okay. And basically, you can see that the yellow mode is almost not impacted by the dynamical quadrupoles. So when we include the dynamical quadrupoles, and that makes sense because this mode is, uh, is dominated by the, the, by the dipolar interaction. But on the other hand, for the acoustic modes, so in red, without the dynamical quadrupoles, uh, their contribution is largely overestimated. And that leads to a, 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 a larger overestimation of the scattering rates. And therefore, the mobility is actually underestimated uh, by 65% in this case. So it's really far from being negligible. Okay, so we've seen a lot of things, but uh, where is Abinit in all this exactly? Well, basically with Abinit, you can first compute the dynamical quadruple tensor, which is something that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, you cannot do with any other code. Then you can compute the phonon limited mobility, starting from a, a phonon job, a DFPT job, that gives you the DDB and DVDB files that contain all the information related to the phonons. And then you also have to compute the wave function on the dense mesh, but for that, it's actually possible to greatly reduce the, the, the computational cost because it's possible to compute only the state close to the CBM or the VDM in the pockets where all the transport happen. And this actually allowed us to compute the mobility on, on very dense meshes up to 400 by 400 by 400. So the, it is <laughs> quite dense uh, and the implementation is quite efficient. There is a tutorial online for all of this. You can follow this, uh, this, this path. And then with ABPI, there are many tools, first of all, to plot and analyze the results. So for instance, with ABOPEN, or using robots to plot the, uh, the, the conversion studies or compare line, line width and so on. And finally, we have also created a workflow uh, within ABPI that allows to compute the mobility in a more automatic way. So this is the conclusion that I usually call a take home message, but uh, it will be a tip home message today. So the first one is uh, that you have access to an efficient implementation uh, for a computation of the phone on limited mobility in the lifetimes that is now well documented in, on the website. It is quite efficient. There are many parallelization levels and also many Python tools to make your life easier to automate the, 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 the input creation and the, the, the output analysis. And finally, the dynamical protocols are very important for many semiconductors and they can be computed from first principles with a binit. So basically we have everything we need to compute the mobility. All right, I thank you for your attention and then uh, I'm ready to answer some questions. Thanks very much, uh, Guillaume. Uh, perfect timing. <laughs> um, so let me get started with the questions. Uh, there is a uh, Michel Cote that uh, actually I, I was I was curious about this too. So um, 
he says, I guess that these long range effects are not important for metals uh, as they should be screened out. Uh, and then uh, actually uh, he asks a related question, which is how many electrons are needed in semiconductors to be considered as metal? So, ah, but that will, so indeed in metals, these long range effects disappear because of the screening. Uh, you, you can still have some, uh, some uh, funny stuff with the uh, cone anomalies, for instance. Let's keep it at that. Uh, and then for a semiconductor to enter the metallic regime, I would say, well, it depends. You, you cannot have one number magic for any semiconductor because it will depend on the density of states of the semiconductor. And then in my, in, in, in our test, so we test it by, we, I, I actually computed the mobility for different carrier concentration by in, increasing these carrier concentrations. And then I noticed uh, that the mobility started to change when the, the Fermi level becomes a little bit too close to the, the conduction band minimum. And by little bit too close is in terms of uh, KT. And so at 300 K, it was basically 50 milli electron volts, something like that. And so as soon as the Fermi level becomes higher than that, and then when it enters the bands, it's obviously a metal, but even slightly below, it's a, it can have, I guess, some, uh, some metallic behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in practice, uh, so the, the, the question is, is very interesting because if you look at um, a semiconductor with even a very low level of dopants, uh, from the point of view of, an, if you plug that into Abinit uh, and you calculate it, it, it is a metal for, for, for many, for, in all respects, even with, with a very low carrier concentration. So mm -hmm. you're not able to get uh, easily dynamical charges or quadruples out of it because everything is screened. But so uh, is the transition uh, between uh, 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 in, in the real world is, is the transition like determined by some kind of uh, um, uh, transition from a non adiabatic uh, to an adiabatic uh, regime uh, in interaction between carriers and the lattice or something like that? What do you think? Yeah, I guess there's a there is a the, uh, my guess is that there's a kind of a smooth transition between the semiconductor and metallic metallic case. Mm -hmm. And we should be able to see that by increasing the carrier concentration, but uh, I have not tested that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so, so Michel is giving some uh, follow up on his question. C can you use the plasma model of free electrons to see if the screening is still metallic? And then if the plasma frequency is lower than the phonon frequency, then they will not able to screen the potential. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, something that we can try definitely. Uh, well, actually, we, we, we do have a, a preprint on that uh, recently. This, uh, uh, we, 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 we tried the calculation of non adiabatic dynamical charges. Uh, so, see, because you, 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 uh, ah, yes, it might that. be relevant uh, in, in this context because. Yeah, uh, I've seen that paper. Actually, uh, mm -hmm. we, you always assume when you do these calculations that uh, the electronic structure and, and all the ingredients you put in the transport equation are those of the insulating material. But this can, yeah. can, be, uh, can also change uh, because of electronic transitions change when you fill up the levels, et cetera, et cetera. So. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. And for the metal, it's the same. If you go to finite Q or finite omega, the dielectric response of the metal is no longer perfect. It can, be, can change quite a bit. And so right. it really depends how you take the thermodynamic limits and the adiabatic limits. Right, right, right. It's, so in that respect, I'm not sure that Guillaume's calculations will, have, will be able to get it. If you just change the carrier concentration, there are no, a bunch no. of responses that won't come out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Also, we, we just, I mean, the DFPT run is done for the semiconductor. So it's just a matter of yeah. when we actually compute the lifetimes, we just change the Fermi level. But yeah. all the, the ground state properties and the, the, the DFPT stuff is done for the semiconductor. So. Mm -hmm. Thibault has, uh, has done a number of calculations for explicitly doped systems and the, the electron phonon coupling changes enormously. Okay. So it's much better to start with a very low level of, but finite level of doping, and then you can extrapolate the physics. Mm -hmm. But if you start from zero, it's crap. Okay. Yeah, but then how do you capture the non-adiabatic uh, non effects? Because uh, if you calculate the, phonon, the, the scattering potential uh, in, in a doped system, 
you will have the static scatter, scattering potential with uh, the, the adiabatic one, which is not necessarily relevant to your problem, right? Yeah. So what he what we're doing is taking this uh, this static screening and then adding a an artificial well artificial a model on top to see the interaction with the doping uh, electrons and the additional screening coming from more doping. But you start with the DFPT in a slightly doped system, which I agree is still adiabatic. It's not perfect by any means, but it's, yeah, yeah, it yeah, lets yeah. you do uh, something more flexible rather than rigid band doping just mm -hmm. on top of a, a yeah, neutral yeah. system, which is really crappy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so th th there is another follow-up by, by Michelle. Uh, is, uh, is also wondering if we need to worry about dipole and quadrupole terms in the interpolation of metals. Uh, uh, in in, in uh, inside of applications for superconductivity, well, again, I think yes, there might be. Uh, uh, from, from my perspective, there might be something. But well, you usually consider a metal something that is so. There are so many carriers that all this stuff is screened very rapidly. The, 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 the relaxation time is. Uh, well, I mean, uh, in, in a metal, you, you use, it's very hard to see non adiabaticities. Uh, but if if there is a, a room for a non-adiabatic window in, in a proximity of gamma, then uh, I think this might be uh, this might be an issue. And in within a non-adiabatic theory, you can actually calculate uh, dipoles and quadrupoles. Yeah. Well, at least dipoles. I don't know about quadrupoles. I haven't <laughs> thought about that yet. But, 